Standing by on the line right now, we have Doc Bob Price, also known as the Bible Geek, on the line. Now, Doc Bob Price is the author of numerous books on Christianity and uh, Christian fundamentalism, and inclu- including The Incredible Shrinking Son of Man, Deconstructing Jesus, one of my faves, and the forthcoming A Crock of Christ, A Refutation of Lee Strobel. I'm sure some of us are applauding. It's about time. But we also have Dr. Phil Fernandez on the line, who is going to be arguing uh, for the resurrection of Jesus and that Jesus in, is indeed uh, our Lord and we better recognize. Uh, many of you probably saw his debate from through uh, infidel.org in which he debated uh, Jeff Lauder many years ago. It was a pretty awesome debate. Um, now, Phil Fernandez um, also has, I'm sorry, he's the president of the Biblical Defense Institute and author of The God Who Sits Enthroned, Evidence for God's Existence. Uh, no other gods, a defense of biblical Christianity and God, government, and the road to tyranny, a Christian view of government and morality. Now, we're scheduled in one hour debate, but if you've been listening to my show for a while, it's very rare that that will happen on an interesting discussion such as this. Thanks to both of my guests tonight for appearing. I really appreciate it. Welcome to the Infidel Guy Show. Um, well, I guess we'll start with the question of a very simple question because I know uh, it's amazing how some Christians think a little differently on something so basic. But uh, we'll start with Phil here. Um, first, can you talk to us first about what is Christianity? Since we're going to talk about who Jesus is, talk to us about. I know it sounds silly; most of us should know, but you'll be. I'm pretty sure you're surprised as well that some people really don't understand what Christianity really is. So could you please maybe give a short introduction, but if you have something pre-prepared, feel free to go ahead and, and, and do that as well. Well, I, I've, I've got uh, plenty of things that are pre-prepared. Uh, Dr. Price is a pretty unique uh, unique guy with some unique arguments. i got about 60 pages of notes. So, <laughs> uh, By the way, I would love to see that for my own benefit sometime. Well, I, I told my guys at the Institute that I, I shouldn't be debating you. I should be teaching a, a course on you with, with, with all the stuff, but it just, you, you raised a lot of interesting issues and, uh, wow. it took me off on a lot of tremendous, uh, tangents. But, uh, I, I'll tell you, the book that helped me the most was one that you, uh, uh, one that you endorsed, The Jesus Legend by, uh, Paul Eddy and, and Greg Boyd. Uh-huh. A couple of pals of mine, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, they're real. They're probably more knowledgeable in your thought than uh, any other uh, evangelicals that I know of. So, uh, so that really helped me a lot there. But yeah, I'll try to define Christianity. And before we get going, and uh, uh, traditional biblical Christianity is the it's a, a monotheistic religion, b- belief in one God, but it believes the one God is three persons: the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And uh, Christians believe that God the Son became a man at a point in time about 2,000 years ago uh, to provide salvation for us since we're, we're fallen and we cannot save ourselves. So he died on the cross for our sins. And then on the third day he rose from the dead, conquering death for us and proving that he is who he claimed to be, that he is God. And uh, over a period of 40 days he appeared to numerous witnesses and uh, his followers, the apostles, began to proclaim this message. So so basically, in a nutshell, Christianity is the belief that Jesus is, is God the Son, become a man who died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead to conquer death for us. Okay. And uh, and Bob, I'm curious, uh, you agree with that? Uh, I wouldn't really have any uh, <laughs> sense uh, from that. That's uh, hit a right. lot of the big points and describe it. I'm uh, accurately enough as, as you know what Christian theology says. Indeed, indeed. All right, well, the debate topic tonight um, is, is Jesus the risen Lord. Um, I guess uh, it's up to you. Uh, should I start with Bob, um, Phil, or do you have do you want to start first? Because I'm going to ask, either either way I'm going to ask you, you know, what is your evidence? Who, which, which of you gentlemen would prefer to go first? Well, I, I guess I could go first if sure. it's all right with uh, sure. Dr. Right, sure. and then he could. He's not. Everything I argue for, I'm. I'm sure from uh, studying his stuff, he's not gonna. He's not gonna accept any of it. But, uh, <laughs> but that's how we'll start. We'll start with my view, his okay, view, sure. and then I guess we'll we'll dialogue. Well, sure, sure thing. And a reminder to the listeners, by the way, this is a very informal, you know, uh, debate. So that's why if it's coming across like this, it's it's, it's purposeful. So 
there you have it. And again, we will hopefully have a question and answer segment toward the end of the program, so stand by. I will be addressing your questions, so start preparing them and getting them ready, but that will be toward the end of the program, and I'll let you know when. All right, feel free, uh, Phil. You, you have the floor. Okay, so if I'm going to be arguing for Jesus as the, the risen Lord, and, and by Lord I mean that in a, in a robust way that, uh, that he is uh, uh, Yahweh, that he is God incarnate, and, uh, and that he is risen, I'll start off with, our, with a little bit of argumentation that, that Jesus is, is Lord. Uh, I think probably the, the key work, the monumental work that has been done on this by a New Testament scholar rather recently is uh, by the, uh, Larry Hurtado at the University of Edinburgh in his work, The Lord Jesus Christ, where he argues there for binitarian worship as early as the early 30s A.D. What he's basically saying is that though the early church didn't have the Holy Spirit quite figured out yet, um, the, in the ancient hymns, the ancient creeds, the ancient worship of the early church, uh, they were referring to Jesus as the Lord Jesus Christ and addressing him in prayer and things of that sort. So they were worshiping Jesus alongside the Father. And so he calls that binitarian worship. He traces it back to the early uh, 30s A.D. He argues that Paul began writing approximately around 50 A.D., and he already spoke of Christ's deity in passing. He didn't have to argue for it. It was like it was as if uh, everybody, uh, if you were a Christian, you already acknowledged it. And so he referred to uh, Jesus from the start as the Lord Jesus Christ. For instance, passages Galatians 1, 1 to 3, Romans 1, 3 and 4. Uh, then you also have the, uh, the Son of Man sayings. We're using a principle, we could talk about it later, but a principle called dis dissimilarity, uh, a principle New, New T Testament critics use, uh, critics use to try to verify whether uh, a saying can go back to Jesus or not. But in, uh, in the Son of Man sayings, uh, Jesus claims power to forgive sin. He claims uh, divine characteristics, he, that he would give his life as a ransom for many. And he claimed to be the Messiah, the Son of God, and... Um, and so uh, in the Son of Man sayings, uh, many New Testament scholars will acknowledge that they came from Jesus. Raymond Brown is an example of a New Testament scholar who traces the Son of Man sayings directly back to Jesus, and he speaks of himself as uh, uh, a divine uh, person uh, coming to save mankind. Also, if we use the principle of embarrassment from Mark 13:32. Uh, we see where Jesus said that he didn't know the day or the hour of his return, only the Father knew. But there he refers to himself as the Son, and so Jesus is claiming to be uh, the, the Son of God. There's also passages in, in Q where Jesus refers to himself as the Son of God. Uh, Q would be the material that was uh, used by both uh, Matthew and Luke, but not found in Mark. Most scholars would date it back to the 40s and the 50s uh, A.D. So we have early evidence that Jesus did consider himself uh, to be the Lord, to be God, and you find this in the ancient creeds as well. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16:22 says, "Our Lord come," and it's a it's a prayer uh, to Jesus. Romans 1, 3, and 4. Raymond Brown, Oscar Coleman, and uh, Martin Hengel believe that this is an early pre-Pauline confession, and it's probably a Palestinian origin. So, I mean, if you go to the earliest days of Christianity, Jesus is proclaimed as uh, as the Lord. Uh, and then I use the Gary Habermas. I was a student of, of Habermas at uh, Liberty University. And I used the Gary Habermas, Mike Lacona uh, argument for Jesus' resurrection that uh, virtually all, new, all critical New Testament scholars acknowledge uh, certain things. Now, the, Dr. Habermas has read, uh, I believe it's 15, over 1,500 of the world's leading New Testament scholars, um, everything that they've put in print dealing with the resurrection between 1975 and to, probably to about a couple of years ago. He's usually a couple of years behind in German, French, and English. And he, he has uh, documented that somewhere between, you know, 97, 98, 99 percent of uh, all uh, the world's leading New, New Testament critical scholars acknowledge that Jesus died by crucifixion and that the disciples had experiences in which they believed that they saw him risen from the dead after his death, and this transformed their lives. Uh, Paul's life was transformed by what he believed was a post-resurrection appearance of Jesus, and then James's life was, was transformed, and many would point uh, to the creed in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 
3 to 5 as uh, evidence there for uh, James seeing the risen Lord. And so virtually all New Testament scholars consider that historical fact. Um, now, the empty tomb, uh, somewhere between 70 and 75 percent of the world's leading New Testament scholars acknowledge the empty tomb, uh, but with the principle of embarrassment where the ladies find the tomb empty and uh, the leaders of the early church, uh, Peter and John, don't believe them and butt heads with them on it and stuff, and then they, they end up looking bad, the women end up looking looking good. Um, that would be the principle of embarrassment, which would be to, you know, to show that the uh, New Testament authors probably did not make that up. And so I, I think even though only only between 70 and 75 percent of the scholars acknowledge the empty tomb, I think we can er argue uh, for it based on the principle of embarrassment as well. And so when you put these together, this minimal data, and you find find these in uh, early creeds and the ancient sermons in Acts chapters 1 through 12, in Paul's writings where Paul speaks of, of Jesus as risen, when you put this data together, I think the, the most plausible explanation is that Jesus did in fact rise from the dead. And since I've shown that he did claim to be God, his resurrection from the dead would be the ultimate proof, uh, proving uh, that, he, uh, that he is in fact who he claimed to be. All right. Thank you very much. For that um you're very concise and comprehensive and certainly very very well read and i commend you for all of that um, i don't often uh, uh run into that with uh, people i discuss this with so i'm uh, happy to acknowledge all of that uh with a great deal of this i, I don't think one can prove or disprove it exactly i, I tend to uh to offer the uh likelihood or unlikelihood that, that uh, a text would be best understood a certain way. Sometimes passages uh, strike me as, as more naturally interpreted if you read them one way or another, and I don't think uh, you can just uh, prove my case or any other, at least in my uh, in my years of reading this stuff, I've come to think it's a little more ambiguous than that. But so I'm not trying to like prove a case here. But this is this is like my reaction to these points, with which of course I'm, I'm pretty familiar. Uh, for one thing, the I think it should go off the table. I really don't like when when uh, Greg and Gary and these people. Um, quote, uh, nose counts. I always like the way uh, Francis Schaeffer put that. You, you don't establish truth by majority vote. Uh, you, you uh, like you can get a bunch of Roman Catholic Mary scholars in the room and decide, you know, ask, ask them how many of them think she rose bodily into heaven. It wouldn't surprise me if most of them thought so and were sincere, but it wouldn't count as very likely to me. But it doesn't matter, because you, you do just have to do what you're, you're of course, doing in most of the presentation there, look at the, the individual arguments. Uh, it, but to me, it, it just I, I've wound up espousing views that I once considered uh, fringe and crazy views only to be rebuked by my own reading uh, and forced eventually to uh, uh, occupy a, a much vilified uh, set of opinions, so one of them being about the sources. I tend to think that uh, Q is uh, rather late. Uh, I tend to think that uh, Paul wrote none of the epistles attributed to him. I get into a lot of reasons for this in my forthcoming uh, book, The Amazing Colossal Apostle. And one reason it's difficult to uh, debate this stuff is you have to, like, try to put in place uh, whole uh, rival paradigms of different ways of looking at the evidence. But uh, I, I see the Pauline material coming from... Uh, mostly within the first century or up to the mid-second, uh, uh, if you want to throw in the, the pastorals and so on. The Gospels, I think, uh, probably are a good bit later than usually thought. I could go into why I think that, though, Mark is the earliest. It probably comes from 100 or so, and the others are after that, uh, that none of them are based on eyewitness um, traditions and so on but I, I don't know if that if the absolute dates matter really a, a lot of this has to do with the comparison of individual materials within the gospels and when you get to things like did jesus claim to be god there's no inherent reason a uh, wise uh, religious teacher uh, should uh, not uh, claim to be god incarnate there have been uh, various ones that uh, 
seem to think so, that they were God incarnate in, in one way or another, or like with Baha'u'llah, the, the manifestation of God, which is just a hair's breadth of difference conceptually. I don't buy the old trilemma argument. I think that's really a, an oversimplification. So there, there's no there's no inherent problem with thinking Jesus could have taught he was God. Um, I don't think it's a bad idea to, to conclude that. It, the, my problem with it is that I just don't think once you compare the relevant gospel texts, you have anything that goes back to uh, Jesus along these lines. For instance, the whole Gospel of John, which in my translation, I, I translate with pretty strongly on the deity of Christ side. For instance, in my in my pre-Nicene New Testament, when, when I came to the statements where Jesus says, uh, I came from God, I thought, well, now what does that mean? He doesn't just mean, you know, God's in the next room and I walk through the door. Uh, so I get translated, I emerged from the Godhead. I don't mind seeing, you know, claims of godhood on the lips of Jesus, but I don't think that uh, John uh, is is any kind of traditional material. It, it's it got such a distinctive style, which it shares with um, between the narrator, Jesus, and all the other characters, and the uh, writer of uh, the Johannine epistles, and it's so different from anything in the synoptic gospels that you might as well be quoting uh, the Pistis Sophia. I mean, there are loads of, as you know, uh, loads of documents that are filled with ostensible sayings of Jesus that are so distinctive and different, you just realize, yeah, this is not historical material. Somebody else is just speaking prophetically, they think, with the voice of Jesus, or it's inspired fiction or something. But it seems to me that is that, that literary similarity among the Johannine material and the difference between it and anything else just makes the Johannine I am statements, etc., just off the table as evidence. I love the Gospel of John. I, I think it's my favorite gospel. It's mighty profound. I love it, but I don't think it's historical. I used to try to make every argument I could, like the old George Ladd, uh, William Temple argument, that maybe this is what Jesus said in private, but I thought it, it doesn't represent it that way. Uh, I've said nothing in private. I asked those who heard me. I said, this is just a rationalization. I just found myself unable to accept it. Then when you get into the, the synoptics, did Jesus even claim that he was the Messiah? Uh, if you look at the confession of Caesarea Philippi stories, and, and you see how different they are, uh, you are the Holy One of God, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, you are the Christ of God, uh, you are the Christ, or in Thomas, Master, my mouth is incapable of saying what you're like. What did he say, if any of those things? In fact, uh, Gerd Tyson has a very good grammatical argument that the whole scene seems to be derived by Mark from his earlier scene where Herod Antipas is saying, uh, going over the the arguments, uh, you know, who do men say that I am, which is made, again, the springboard for the Christological confession. I don't think that, I mean, you'd really have to, to argue hard that, that that goes back to Jesus. Uh, the, the idea of forgiving sins, uh, the whole point is that it seems to me, as Matthew catches it, is God has delegated to human beings the authority that most think is unique to him to forgive sins on earth as he does in heaven, which fits the fact that uh, in Matthew and John, Jesus delegates the same authority to his own disciples. It doesn't make them God or Jesus or anything. The Son of Man sayings, I agree with Bultmann. That, oh, for one thing, I think it's naive of the conservative critics slash apologists to say that because you don't have much of this outside the Gospels, and there's a little bit of it, uh, Stephen and James and uh, Hegesippus and so on, you, referring to Jesus in the third person as the Son of Man, they say, well, then Jesus must have said it. And I said, wait a minute, who do you think wrote the Gospels, Jesus? I mean, that, that whole manner of, of argumentation is naive. It, it's circular. Uh, we don't know. We, the very thing we don't know and we're trying to establish is whether Jesus said it. Uh, it's not unlikely that people put things on the lips of Jesus, and you have prime candidates for that, or so it reads to me, mm -hmm. when you have, as Bultmann said, retrospective summaries of what Jesus came to do, like a classic would be in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. 
don't go thinking I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. Oh, no, I came to establish them, to fulfill them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this seems to me to be a Christian, a Jewish Christian polemic against rival Gentile Christian propaganda that, yeah, Jesus came to do this. What was the mission of Jesus? Jesus came to abolish the law and the prophets, as in Romans. Uh, he's the end of the law for everyone that believes. You, you've got uh, almost explicitly intra-Christian argumentation, and they're pulling rank by putting it on the lips of Jesus, and that's apparent by the fact that you've got these summations of what Jesus or the Son of Man came to do in retrospect. How would you sum up what Jesus was here to do, as we still do today? That kind of talk seems to me anachronistic uh, for Jesus himself. As for the Son of Man came passages, I think uh, Perrin made a real good case that there's a, a kind of a midrashic complex that early Christians put together from Zechariah 11, was it, about the, uh, they will look upon uh, him whom they've pierced and uh, and uh, Psalm 110, and uh, so on. By, by the way, Bob, an issue of time fairness, um, if you would please maybe touch on, I know you, I'm sorry, you're right in the middle of your thought, but uh, touch on Phil's talking about the, the resurrection. And so that okay, I'm we, sorry about that. If somebody's yeah. got to stop me or I'll go on forever. I know. Yeah. Okay, well, I just, in short, don't think there's adequate reason to think that the historical Jesus, assuming there was one, did claim to be God. Not that it would have been bad if he had. It just seems to me I don't see the evidence. On the resurrection... Uh, I uh, just think there we have no evidence stemming from even direct mm -hmm. uh, visions of Jesus. Boltman was willing to say, well, at least we know these guys had uh, Easter morning visions. Oh, no, we don't. Uh, the, the 1 Corinthians 15 thing, as I've gone into detail about before, uh, does not seem to me. It's like the Apostles' Creed. It's, it's The very fact that it is a creed shows that it couldn't come from the early days. That kind of thing comes up later in the evolution of religions. The gospel stories of the resurrection are, are just all of them uh, transparently either derived from uh, myths of, of competing cults or they're midrashically based on dance or uh, they, they're rewritten versions of one another. They partake of a common genre of apotheosis narratives, uh, and uh, they're redactionally transformed all over the place. And it just seems to me that uh, though it all might be true, there's no particular reason to think so. And this is why I switched sides. I had been an evangelical apologist. I just could no longer bear the burden of trying to say, well, you know, it still could be true. Uh, and so I, I just respect and love the Christian tradition, but as with the Buddhist and Muslim and others, I just cannot affirm it is factually true. All right. Uh, Phil, what I'm, I'm going to do, gentlemen, at this point, we're getting some requests from the room, which makes sense. Um, they would like to hear a little bit more point, counterpoint. Of course, these are just pretty much an introduction and then a response. Phil, of course, feel free to respond to Bob. But at, at this point, I would like you to also allow... Um, Bob, the opportunity to interject at will this time. So let's do a little bit of cross yeah, I'll try to keep it short. I'm sorry. Exactly, though, Bob. Yes, keep it very short. But uh, <laughs> if you can, uh, but feel feel free. Go ahead and address Bob's points, and then let's do a little, little bit of crossfire and within reason here. Sure. Um, yeah, and I really you know appreciate uh, where Dr. Price is uh, is coming from, just in the fact that he's done he's done so much research and has looked looked into these issues. He's just a, a brilliant man, and it's just. It's an honor to be be here talking with him. Um, at the same time, uh, he talked about, you know, you can't settle things through nose counts. Well, I agree. Mm. Um, at the same time, we're talking about New Testament scholarship. I mean, if we had a room filled with um, uh, scientists and, um, and then we had one guy who thought the earth was flat, um, and, and sure, he would say, well, yeah, I don't want to settle this by nose counts. Well, the fact that they're scientists and, and, you know, it should say something. And when you have the vast majority, I mean, we're talking in incredibly high percentages, when the vast majority of New Testament scholars uh, are saying uh, basically the premises that I'm using. Now, they don't agree with me on the conclusion. Um, at the same time, the premises I'm using you have uh, uh, almost uh, universal acceptance from New Testament scholars. So this isn't like majority vote. Well, you this, just this have to have the flat earther explain his view. 
then they could laugh them off, but it's no excuse. It's not an added argument. Like you could have people, I, I imagine you'd have a vast majority of scientists saying they believe in global warming, but I'm afraid I do not. I think it is, is politically correct, liberal asceticism masquerading as science, just like the nuclear winter hoax was. So I, you can have uh, people agreeing for a lot of reasons that don't really stem from their expertise. Yeah, but I would say the global warming wouldn't be as, as good of a, an issue there because uh, you do have uh, some scientists who study the field that are on both sides of the issue, and, and I would side with you. I don't think it's really really going on, but I think this is something more like the, like the Holocaust. I'm trying to take the the cruelty out of out of the Holocaust here for a minute, but I mean, no, um, no, I understand, I understand. Someone denies the historicity of the Holocaust. I mean, they're asking us to rewrite all the history books. And I, I think that you need, I mean, well, you're, you're on the right track in that you're trying to get your word out and convince more people. If we came back in 50 years, you might be the one saying, well, New Testament scholarship agrees with me, and I might be the one saying, don't use no, nose counts. But at the very least, you'd have to admit the burden of proof. And when you're dealing with New Testament studies, the one who has New Testament scholarship, the majority of New Testament scholars on their side, uh, the burden of proof seems to shift to the other side. That's why I take the approach in all my books to explain why I think Crossan and Mack and all these people, and not just F.F. F. Bruce, are wrong. Uh, they do not consistently apply their own insights, etc. I agree with you. I, I need to, to uh, bear the burden of proof, which I have always tried to do. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, you brought up Crossan and Mack, and then, of course, it's Marcus Borg. And, and, uh, oh, yeah, he's other, real wrong. At the, at the, at the Jesus <laughs> Seminar, but... But these guys, uh, it, it, I think it's rather interesting that I, in a, in a dialogue like this, I, I as an evangelical can use them to argue for my position. So these, these are not evangelicals, and you, you, obviously you admit that. Oh, yeah, they're yeah. not evangelicals. They're on the far left side of New Testament criticism, yet they would still give uh, many of these minimal facts. Uh, yeah, but uh, you have to. It just doesn't matter. I mean, the consensus of scholars was that Jesus should be uh, executed. Uh, we tend to think that wasn't a, a good call. Uh, I, I just think it doesn't matter. You have to listen to what the Holocaust denier says, what the guy that thinks we didn't go to the moon uh, says, or what Galileo says, and just judge it on the merits of the case. Well, and uh, but I, I think you would agree. You're not going to. You're not going to overturn. I mean, I mean, you know, 150 years ago. You would have the consensus of New Testament scholarship, and I'd be the, the guy on the outside. Oh, no, no, my my position has never been uh, popular, though it has been taken more seriously than it is now. Well, at least uh, 150 years ago is uh, the first time that I've uh, I, I've seen it in uh, in New Testament scholarly works and all. But, uh, but 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 basically, what I'm getting at though is you would have to admit though that 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 burden. Well, yeah, in fact, you did admit that the burden yes, of proof oh, is yeah. there. Sure. Um, uh, and you know, maybe who knows? Maybe 50 years from now, New Testament scholarship will be will be back moving back towards your side of the issue. Right, uh, but when people like Boltman, who was obviously was not an evangelical, was admitting that something happened, they had visions or something of that sort. Even Marcus Borg refers to them as apparitions. That the apostles really did see something, and he doesn't want to speculate on what exactly uh, that was. That does seem to move in, in the direction that the evangelical wants to argue. But, but Borg, for instance, is a kind of a neo-rationalist, like the old Essene hypothesis thing. He, he just wants to believe in this kind of new agey paradigm that there really are no natural laws and uh, that anything can happen. And so uh, if we can open up the window to, to that kind of thing, then what's the problem believing in a few New Testament miracles? He seems to me to have no real methodology. It's just to kind of split the difference between constituencies that he feels comfortable in. Well, I, I, I think it's uh, it's interesting though, that you brought up how worldview often shapes uh, one's conclusions, and I, I I don't think I'm exempt from it. I don't think you're exempt from it. But uh, what I have seen in, in New Testament scholarship is this this bias against miracles, and that if we just treated the New Testament manuscripts like we would treat uh, any other ancient literature, and then just test it like that rather than stacking the deck against it, but that's um, exactly I, what I, I do. I never once have 
I have appealed to the idea that miracles could not happen, I always start out saying I am in no position to say no miracles ever happened or could happen. Uh, God may exist and could do anything at any time. Uh, I am not a metaphysical naturalist, but let's look at the likelihood of these stories. So I agree with you that that is just a big cheat to uh, you know to dogmatize at the beginning. I, I carefully avoid doing that. Yeah, well, and uh, it's, it's interesting, though, because when you look at the the liberal uh, or the uh, higher critical principles to uh, used with the Gospels to identify authentic passages, um, I, I think it'd be like the, the principle of dissimilarity, multiple attestation, enemy attestation, the list goes on, embarrassment. If we use that type of criteria to determine whether or not we're going to accept passages um, from other works, other well, ancient... We do. Well, I, I I don't I don't see how uh, I don't see how you, you're going to get uh, I don't with, with a, a lot of ancient literature I don't even think you can do that because you don't have number one the, that many manuscripts and number two that many men, men, uh, mentions of that particular historical figure. Yeah, you're right. Most of the time you can, but Neusner has found, for instance, you can do it pretty darn well with the Mishnah and the Talmud, where there's a lot of repetition, a lot of stuff attributed to Hillel or Gamaliel or whatever, and you can uh, you can show the same kind of problems. And with uh, some few uh, Greek philosophical texts, or with uh, certain things like uh, the over a hundred Sufi sayings of Jesus, or to go over to a real biggie, over into Buddhism or into the Analects of Confucius, you have the same sort of criteria used the same way. Now, I, I'm pretty agnostic. I don't think that any of these really turn up any solid evidence, because I think they're, the people that use these criteria are way too optimistic. They don't seem to realize you can have a multiply attested rumor. In fact, almost all urban legends are. That doesn't make them true. Early tradition means absolutely nothing. It may be early rumor. You just don't know. It could be true. But uh, uh, you can, or just, you know, I've often had people say, if you're going to be that skeptical, you can't believe anything you read in the newspaper. And I said, yeah, that's right. Whenever I have found myself quoted in the newspaper, I find i got to call up somebody and apologize because I've been re misrepresented in an embarrassing way. Uh, and uh, so I don't uh, <laughs> think, uh, I'm not very optimistic about any uh, uh, accurate reporting. Yeah, I, well, I, I agree with you about the newspaper, but, but I think that if, if we can trace this back, like most New Testament scholars believe that we can, then once, once we get it back, if it is early, uh, then you have most scholars, of course, they're, they're acknowledging things that you don't acknowledge. Um, but, uh, but they That's would say. That's why that I try to show in, like, uh, the uh, Incredible Shrinking Son of Man, case by case, why each one of them falls apart and why the defenses of them fail. Like, for instance, what would you say about that chain of development, apparently, on the Caesarea Philippi Confession of Peter? Is that all an illusion? No, I, I, I just think when you have. I used to be a police officer. I was on a, a naval uh, submarine base, and I did some law enforcement there. And um, many, if I, I was never looking for exactness when I interviewed different witnesses. If I got exactness, I knew they were in collusion. Uh, but what I was looking for was a basic reliability and agreement on the key points. But you don't have that if you're, I mean, you're looking for like a couple of words, God or Son of God or something, and that's precisely the issue on which uh, they differ. It's, it's like this new thing. They came up with this Gabriel's revelation thing, whatever that turns out to be. They're not even sure that it's worded in such a way, that it actually refers to the resurrection. Well, geez, I can't wait to read the whole thing, but uh, I don't see how you could put much on that if it's not even certain what the person said. And it's the very crucial words, especially in the, the Caesarea Philippi thing, that, that is lacking. Uh, if he really said the Christ, the Son of the Living God, why would uh, why would that be added in the subsequent Gospel to Mark, who had only a shorter version? I, it just seems to me, uh, if if anything is probable, I mean, we could just throw up our hands and say, well, we don't know, we weren't there, which is true. But if we want to at least uh, present a reasonable guess, the probability would have to be that the later writer has embellished the earlier. Again, we don't know, but what's the more likely? Hmm. Yeah, well, and, and, and there it, it gets to the debate about Mark and priority, and I, I believe that's still the majority view among New Testament scholars. There used to be some that argued that Matthew wrote first. Um, and then, then you still have the, the throwback uh, 
evangelical New Testament scholars who still argue for literary independence and that there would be oral traditions, oral teachings behind all uh, the three synoptic gospels, and that's why it would say it, at, at times it would look like they were borrowing from each other. But that, reality, that's even worse because there you're just dealing with uh, a bunch of people in a focus group who, who can't even agree on what was said. That, that's I mean, with no priority, you just have to throw up your hands and say, "Who the heck knows?" And ultimately, we don't know. Well, well, what we're arguing for though is uh, is Jesus the risen Lord, and I think that comes out clear in all four gospels in the in the entire New Testament. And so, if I were a police officer looking at this this supposed testimony coming from either eyewitnesses or people who knew eyewitnesses, uh, I would not use contradictions to, 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 to shoot it down because they tell the same basic story throughout uh, that this uh, Jewish carpenter uh, gathered followers, uh, taught them about the law, taught with authority like no other rabbis, made statements and acted as if he is uh, God incarnate, now, how, how would you do that? What would be behavior suggesting you were God in the flesh? Well, I, I, I think if you just read this, the Sermon on the Mount, I, I, I spent 53 weeks preaching through the Sermon on the Mount, and if you just look at it through Jewish eyes, Jesus is saying things that uh, someone would only... It, it, it was the why the Jewish audience, it often strikes us as... Uh, as uh, a puzzle. Why would they say, wow, he taught with such authority, not like the the Pharisees and the scribes. Because and, that's and the, Christians writing that in the Gospels. In fact, Matthew has borrowed it from uh, Mark's exorcism in the synagogue. He speaks with authority. Matthew decides to put that on the end of the sermon instead. But it, virtually every line of the Sermon on the Mount is paralleled in rabbinic writings. They couldn't have thought that the only God would dare say such things. For... Uh... Excuse me there, but for, for a guy who said that he started out your discussion saying we can't prove or disprove this, things are too ambiguous, and now you're telling me that uh, uh, exactly who borrowed from whom and, well, uh, and, and why this guy did that thing. It seems to me that if we can't prove or disprove things, then maybe, maybe we shouldn't try to uh, psychoanalyze the authors. Well, my, my point here is that uh, you certainly cannot take uh, the the uh, dogmatism, if that's what it is, of the Sermon on the Mount as evidence that only a god would say this, since the same stuff, almost verbatim, is said commonly by the cynics, the stoics, the rabbis, and so on. It was all very good, but all common coin. Uh, it, it's just, it seems to me, outrageous special pleading to say that only God would say this. No, well, uh, only a guy who thought he was God. Because here Jesus is saying, you have heard, and then he just basically said, now throw out all the, you know, hundreds of years of oral tradition, but truly I say to you, and he puts his interpretation of the scriptures on the same level as the scriptures, he does not appeal to any of the great rabbis that have gone before, Hillel or Shammai, whoever they may be, and, uh, and he just says, my interpretation of the Torah holds as, is as true as the Torah itself. I will go right to the Torah and interpret it for you. I think if we read it with uh, through Jewish eyes, it becomes amply clear. And then he's and then he, and then in the Sermon on the Mount, he makes it clear: if you don't accept my teachings, uh, that you'll be destroyed by the storms of life. If uh, if you accept them, it's like building your house on the rock. These are things that no uh, no uh, rabbi with the uh, sure they do, sure they do. It's like John the Baptist: uh, if you don't repent, as I say, you know the coming one is coming, and your butt's in a sling when that happens. Does he, does he mean that he is God to be able to issue such warnings? Or is he a prophet? Uh, the, like all of this stuff that the rabbis say comes from their study of the Torah. They don't all accept all the oral tradition, but the Sadducees rejected the Pharisees' oral tradition. That didn't mean they thought they were God. They thought the Pharisees had some nerve making their interpretations tantamount to the Torah. And the idea that you've heard it said, but I say to you, that even if that were not not probably a redactional creation of Matthew, the famous Matthean Antitheses, which takes uh, sayings of Jesus in other Gospels that do not appear in such a contrast. It seems to be Matthew's attempt to say, okay, Old Testament A, Jesus, column B. You, you still have um, uh, n nothing much different than the teacher of righteousness in the Dead Sea Scrolls who said that, geez, lucky me, God picked me to give the true interpretation of the Torah, and here it is, you'd better believe it. That didn't mean he thought he was God. 
And, and even if you have Jesus saying these things, it certainly doesn't mean that uh, either. Well, uh, if we have Jesus saying that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, in a religious context, acting like, well, you should be calling me Lord, Lord, but you got to also obey me um, or you're lost. In a religious context, if he did say that, um, but, but that's the way you phrase the question. If he did say that, I'd say it's pretty clear. He, in a Jewish uh, mindset, he's claiming to be uh, equal with God. And it seems that that's the way his audience understood him. But you're, you're still just proof texting the, the thing. There's, there's good reasons, in my opinion, at least they, they make sense to me as I read, that, uh, that uh, the idea of Jesus saying, uh, my father this, my father that, it's interesting that if you look in Q and in Mark, uh, there are, uh, there's like one or two occurrences of that phrase. Uh, Jesus speaks of the father and so on. But then uh, when you jump to the special Matthean material, there's a huge leap in, in the number of my father statements the special lucan material has a huge amount even more and then it's astronomical in john i believe james dunn an evangelical points this out in his book uh, the uh, disunity of the new testament or whatever it's called uh, unity of the new testament i guess uh, he uh, even he admits look come on uh, this is christology of the early christians they all believed in it but they they're certainly accentuating it and making jesus speak with uh, the voice of the new testament creed i mean he could have said it it's just that given the state of the evidence it doesn't appear to me that he did i would not be affronted if we could show that he did i don't think it's a bad idea but it just seems to me that the evidence crumbles every in every place uh, and uh, so that, that it's just well it's possibly said it but you know the jehovah's witnesses could be right uh, you know why I think so though yeah, well, I, uh, again, I think, you know, and I could, I could throw in scholars like Jeremiah, who uh, attributes uh, not only Father to the lips of, of Jesus, uh, calling his, uh, God his Father in a special, unique way, uh, but he even, he even says he probably used the word Abba. Uh, oh, that's almost. another false trail. Where does Jesus use this? In, in the Garden of Gethsemane in Mark, where there is no one there to hear him, Marcus has omitted all possible witnesses, and so how does he know what Jesus said? Uh, I think it's he just gratuitously uh, puts on the lips of Jesus what Christians commonly said, as we can see in Romans and Galatians. Christians spoke of God as Abba, which apparently meant nothing more than just plain old father, as Raymond Brown pointed out. There is no lexical evidence that it continued to mean this dada business. That, that's just a fantasy of pietists. Uh, who want this personal relationship with God, uh, gooeyness uh, on the lips of Jesus. There's this neurosis almost that everything we believe has to be said by Jesus, which always surprises me. I mean, this isn't the Bible good enough for you. Why do we have to prove that Jesus said everything and authorized everything? Well, I, I find it interesting that, that, that uh, people like yourself, even even... The New Testament Scholarship Guild, which I'm, I'm using uh, the thrust of their work, uh, but it, it surprises me how hypercritical uh, we can be of the uh, New Testament manuscripts and I don't see them doing that with other ancient writers. Sure they do. There are people that will tell you how many of the epistles of Plato cannot really be by him. What are uh, what must be interpolations here and there? I, I don't have any expertise in those areas, but or the criticism of the Hadith. It was Muslims themselves that began to do exactly what we're doing here uh, with the hundreds of thousands of, of oral traditions about Muhammad. This is like uh, Bukhari and Muslim and these other guys said that the prophet cannot possibly have said all this stuff. It's obvious that you have the scholars coining traditions of what he said just to back up their own views. And so they just sorted them out and still came up with a grossly exaggerated number. It seems to me that that's, that's even in the same milieu, basically. Uh, and there's just no problem with uh, a, a scenario that would fit perfectly uh, what we seem to have contradictory uh, anachronistic statements attributed to Jesus, which he cannot possibly have said all of. Uh, it just seems to me the burden of proof here is on the person that would say, oh yeah, everything in the Gospels he said, everything in those other books he didn't say. It's just, just canonical polemics, not historical scholarship, and 
the, the criticism used is used with the, the sayings of the Buddha, Muhammad, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, and I, I'm, I was using a minimal facts case, and, uh, and, and but there's no reason to think these things are facts. Well, it, it seems that uh, you're in the minority. Probably, probably that about, doesn't matter. The, the arguments have to be dealt with. Was Copernicus wrong? Because he was in the minority. Was that? Copernicus was in the minority for a while. It just didn't matter. Yeah, well, I, 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 I think I think it does matter when you have the the, the, the whole thrust of New Testament scholarship going. No, on. sir, it does not. And there are obvious reasons. I, I hesitate to bring up why they would would say these things. It's hard to to think outside the box when you're in church reciting the creed every week. Well, you Naturally, know. certain things are going to look good to them. I don't mean they're lying about it. I know they're sincere, but it's it's hard to imagine that uh, they could get to the point of, uh, of of being that objective about it. If that doesn't matter to me, I need to look at the argument in every case, which I do. I don't care what their belief is, but it's certainly not hard to imagine how you could have a great majority believe, like, again, a bunch of Roman Catholic Mariologists. It doesn't surprise you that they all believe in the assumption of Mary. You say you have obvious reasons for your, your views. Apparently they're obvious to you and to almost no one else. I think uh, when you debated... Uh, That's just not the case. I mean, I don't think you've really even uh, tried to address this business of the confession of Peter or the great difference between the Johannine and synoptic idiom of the teaching of Jesus. These things, these are commonly uh, uh, observed things by the guild. Not that that's why I buy them. They just make sense to me. But uh, I, I'm not just asking for credence. In fact, I'm not asking for anybody to believe me. I'm just uh, saying here is the, here's the basis for my doubts and theories. Uh, no one has to believe it. I don't give a damn. Yeah. Well, but uh, but whatever the case, but you you say that for obvious reasons you reject this, you reject that. But but then you admit uh, in your debate with Dr. Habermas, you're a voice crying in the wilderness. Your right. your views are way out there. Um, apparently, you know, the, the Jesus Seminar, I do not think that they get together and say, look, let's try to find evidence for Jesus' resurrection. These guys are not on my side. You, you would agree with that, correct? Uh, yeah, I, I don't agree with them on most things. Yeah, but I mean, but, I'm way out there, but it just doesn't matter. You have to look at the arguments. Yeah, but, but basically, as I study New Testament scholars and, and their work, okay, uh, it seems to me even the scholars who are trying to argue against the resurrection, they end up using principles that are, I think, are stacked. They stack the deck against the reliability of the New Testament manuscripts, but they end up coming back, even with their biased principles, uh, with, with sayings of Jesus and acts of Jesus that they just can't deny. And so, yes, you have the Jesus Seminar on the far left, though not, not no, nowhere near as left, far left as you. Uh, but you have the majority of New Testament scholars acknowledging that Jesus did, in fact, live, that he did die on the cross by crucifixion, and that his apostles' lives were transformed uh, by experiences in which they saw him alive. After what do we know about the apostles, for example? I mean, this is just Sunday school stuff. We don't have any knowledge about these guys from the Gospels or anything else. Even the idea that they're all martyred comes from legendary apocryphal acts from the 3rd century. We, we, there's just so much of this stuff we, we don't have any data for. We, we have good evidence for, for a lot of this stuff, but... Uh, but you see, if I were a skeptic, I would do exactly what you do, do Dr. Price. I would deny everything. Well, mm -hmm. do you think, for instance, that the Acts of Paul, the earliest story of Paul's martyrdom, is correct when it has Paul pick up his severed head and come back in and tell Nero, you're next? And that then a couple of days later, Paul's disciples found his tomb empty and Paul greeted them and ascended into heaven. This is the earliest account of the death of Paul we have. I mean, I'm just saying with that, I don't consider reliable. I doubt if you do either. And, and, I, I, and Yeah, you know I don't consider that reliable, but I... Contrary to you, I do believe the Apostolic Fathers, like, you know, you, you could pick up a, a, a church history book, you could read uh, New Testament scholars, and everybody dates the Apostolic Fathers from ni about 95 A.D. to 150 Not years. everybody. There are huge debates and have been for a, a couple of hundred years over. In fact, Calvin dismissed all the Ignatian epistles as, as spurious with good reason. Uh, Clement, uh, that's anonymous. It doesn't even claim to be by Clement. Uh, and then just one after the other, these things are Lightfoot and the others tried to make the circular argument that these guys guarantee the New Testament when 
all the same questions have to be raised about them. But, uh, but if we were this hypercritical, hyper this is not hypercritical. If we were of any other ancient literature, we'd be, we'd be uh, trashing just about everything. We are, and that is what happens in critical scholarship. There, no, there's lively we... debates. Did Homer write all or any of the Odyssey and the Iliad? Are they unitary works? Uh, I mean, these things are common, the, the, this kind of argumentation, and again, on, on the scriptures of all religions. The, this is not some unique, hypercritical thing. You, uh, you, you uh, basically penalize the New Testament for multiple authors writing about the same events, uh, whereas in, in most of the time in ancient literature, you might get just one or two different sources. They might be 100 years or so removed from the fact and we accept it as historical. Oh, no, we don't. Uh, not not uh, if there's uh, serious disagreements. We, In many cases, we have to say, geez, you know, we, we really don't know what happened there. Uh, there's this anxiety people have to know what happened and not to want to admit that we don't know, but we just don't know about a lot of things. But in the New Testament, the, the one big problem is that we've got Mark, and it really appears from all kinds of uh, uh, source and textual and redaction critical insights that, that Mark has been rewritten by other people. Uh, and you've got one basic account and an earlier stratum. Many of us think uh, that uh, you can find uh, attested in the Pauline epistles where uh, you don't even have a historical Jesus. And, uh, but suddenly you do in Mark, and, and then you've got other rewrites of that, and then it just goes way out into the stratosphere with uh, the Gnostic and the other uh, Jesus documents. I just don't think there's enough. And that's not like a bunch of independent witnesses on the scene. Uh, I, you know, and I, I would disagree. I mean, the, the, the kind of manuscript evidence you have for the New, New Testament far surpasses any other uh, ancient but That's document. irrelevant, though. Like that, that just shows that uh, a, a, after a certain stage, the copies were pretty much the same. We, we don't know. Uh, I mean, all textual critics, even Metzger and these conservatives, admit that the texts vary the most, the earliest you can go back. And then there's this period of 100 or so years uh, on conservative dating between the Chester Beatty papyri, etc., and, and when they think the books were written. And there we just don't have any evidence at all. We don't know what it was. And, and you'll have a lot of critics say, well, you know, I like William O. Walker. A lot of people will say, I think this passage in First Corinthians or Mark or something was an interpolation. And, and everybody gets up and says, oh, no, there's no evidence for that. Well, yeah, of course there's not because there's no manuscripts of any kind from, from all these decades. So we, we just don't know. It's like a, a fallacy. To, like John Davis Loss, uh, the C.S. Lewis critic, he, he was dealing with this, and he said, if, I, if somebody shows me a whole bunch of pictures of the same person and says, oh, this is, uh, this is uh, an accurate representation of uh, Sam Jones here, oh, yeah, have you got a picture you, you know uh, is directly of Sam Jones? Oh, well, no, we really don't have any. Well, how the heck do you know these things are accurate, then, if you don't have an original to compare it with? Uh, and the whole thing is just circular. You could turn the turn that same reasoning on you, though, if you reject the creed from First Corinthians chapter fifteen. Yet all the ex all the copies that we have that include chapter fifteen in First Corinthians, they have that there. There's no there, there's no evidence that it was missing. Like for instance, for uh, the the uh, John seven fifty three to uh, right. John eight eleven. Uh, the last uh, few verses of uh, Mark chapter sixteen verses nine through twenty. 1 John 5, 7, and 8, we have textual evidence that those were not in the older manuscripts. Yeah, so we can argue that, that uh, we saying, don't have that for the creed of 1 Corinthians 15. But that just doesn't matter since uh, you're dealing with a period there, a tunnel period, where there are no copies of any kind that witness this way or that. And so we don't know what it was. That 170-year period or 150 to 170-year period, well, actually, if we go from 30 A.D., I would say a 120 to 150 year period of time that gives you a green light to just make everything be whatever you want it to be. Well, no, you have to be able to show that there are oddities in the text. For example, an Old Testament one that I've found striking in uh, the thing where this uh, Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, uh, puts out the right eyes of a bunch of guys in Gilead or something, and this leads into Saul uh, rallying the forces of Israel to stop these guys. 
Old Testament scholars had thought, geez, you know, I bet something is missing. In this case, just the opposite, not an interpolation, but an omission. They said, there's, I just bet you this story originally opened with more of an explanation, because usually the Deuteronomic writer has, uh, a, when he brings in a king, he'll say, uh, he'll call him so-and-so, the king of the sons of so-and-so, and there's more of an explanation. I bet something has dropped out. Well, bingo, they discover the Dead Sea Scrolls, and there it is, just as they had surmised it had to be, because there are formal and other criteria that lead you to believe there's been funny business. In this case, that something had been omitted, but in plenty of others, where it looked like uh, something was, was odd, like that, the, geez, can this really be? Like, you could look at the King James and say, wait a minute, how could uh, Mark say the women fled and said nothing to anyone for they were afraid, and then they went and told what the angel told them to? Hold on a minute. Uh, something's wrong here. Someone has added this ending. Well, it turns out uh, that uh, later on they found that, bingo, there are uh, earlier manuscripts that lack. It. Um, one day, somebody might turn up one without First Corinthians uh, 15, uh, 3 through 11. I'm not banking on it, but uh, it seems to me there are plenty of indications that this text does not belong there. So, and, uh, and you argue your arguments from silence as far as the man? No, sir. Uh, from, for 150 years, from, uh, from, from Jesus' recorded death uh, until Irenaeus, you have silence. And then what you have to have have us do is to trust you, and uh, and what you. No, build sir. Your... I set out my arguments and say, what do you think of them? Yes, but then you have to also have us to trust you. No, and sir. Paul Irenaeus and uh, and Tertullian uh, uh, liars because they tell they talk to us about the apostolic fathers and they say the apostolic fathers really were pupils of the apostles and really did live and write. But back. this is just a dogma they had. I don't know if they mentioned these particular guys by name, but they're already operating on what was a dogma of apostolic succession, not not a disinterested historical theory. Yeah, well, in the, in the, but the apostolic succession back then, uh, I teach courses in the history of Christian thought, it, it was a lot different back then uh, than it is today, like for the uh, Roman Catholic Church. It was more when the, when the Gnostic teachers would come up and they would... Uh, write uh, pseudepigrapha and pretend to be uh, uh, apostles when they were not, um, they were doing, I think the Gnostics were doing that, the Gnostic heretics, because they were getting tired of being refuted uh, by the Christians who say, well, wait a minute, I was trained by Polycarp, and Polycarp was trained by the apostles, and the apostles never taught this. So apostolic succession was a strong argument for the first few generations. Now, if the apostolic fathers themselves, if they're writing pseudepigrapha, if they're uh, frauds, then I think they would have claimed to have been the original apostles. But there were people who did. Uh, like that's they, what it was the Gnostic writings. They claimed to be the apostles themselves. Oh, I'm sure they're they're uh, full of it too. But the uh, the New Testament writings are either all uh, uh, either I, I anonymous or pseudepigraphical. I just don't understand the, 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 the seven. There are seven epistles of Paul that virtually every New Testament scholar will give you. Marcus Borg attests to this. And that's Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, uh, Philippians, Philemon, and First Thessalonians. And and you you say that you don't believe Paul wrote any of them. F. C. Bauer gave damning arguments against any but First and Second Corinthians, Romans, and Galatians, and everybody else just retrenched and went back to the sacred number seven. W. C. Van Manen and others used the same arguments that any of these people use against the pastorals or. Or Second Thessalonians or Ephesians, and showed, look, the same problems occur in all of these letters. They all appear to be filled with anachronisms, non sequiturs, implying redactional scenes. They're all like patchwork quilts. I, I invite you to take a look at the notes in my pre Nicene New Testament or when it comes out some year from now or so, the, the amazing colossal apostle, because I go over every epistle in some detail trying to show how it, they are filled with non sequiturs, anachronisms, and various signs that they do not come from the earliest stage of Christianity. Uh, for those, uh, uh, let, let, let me step in here for a second here. Hold that thought for me, uh, Phil, if you would. For those just joining us here tonight, I am the Infidel Guy. You're listening to the Infidel Guy Show. And tonight we have Doc Bob Price and Phil, Doc Phil Fernandez on the program uh, discussing the topic, Is Jesus the Risen Lord? And right now, obviously, we're talking about 
um, some of us, well, inconsistencies in the scripture, um, um, how do we know um, who's written what, and how do we know that the, we can trust the scriptures as true because there's well, a history of additions and uh, things taking out. Anyway, um, guys, at this moment, uh, don't worry, Phil, I'll let you get back up here in a second here. Uh, at this moment, I know many of you have questions. Go ahead and start getting them together. Type them in red, okay, so that I can see them. Type your questions in red in the chat room, and I will relay those to our guests uh, this evening. I really would appreciate that. Okay, Phil, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, and uh, uh, Dr. Price, you, you talk about you talked about a lot with, in your debate with Dr. Haberbass about the the New Testament guild is just into spinning all the time, and I, I just see no reason why the Jesus Seminar would spin in the direction of evangelicalism and concede uh, seven letters as authentically from the Apostle Paul. I, I, I don't see uh, why the Jesus Seminar would concede so much of the minimal fact case of, uh, of Dr. Gary Habermas. It just doesn't make sense. If these guys are going to spin, they're spinning in the other direction. Well, they do have a different direction. I grant you, they're... they're uh... There are, as probably someone like me saying this, but I find that their interest is more theological and ecumenical. So they want Jesus to have said certain things that will make it easier for Jews and Christians to have a powwow. Uh, they want Paul to have said something basic so they can reinterpret it as being pro-feminist, uh, pro-Judaism, pro-liberal, and, and so on. So there's a kind of politically correct theology they want to be able to proof text Paul and Jesus for. So they have a kind of doctored uh, spin version of both. I hate to say that, but it's certainly not true of everybody, but that's certainly my impression. Well, I, I would wonder if we if we don't all have our presuppositions. Uh, it's, yeah, I mean, I, as, I, as I listen to you saying, talking about other spinning, and then you telling it uh, the things that are obviously... Uh, True to you and all, you know. I, I, I obviously you don't consider yourself like like the Bill O'Reilly of New Testament scholarship. The new, the no spin zone. The the, the spin stops here. Um, uh, surely you're not asking us just to accept uh, the results of your scholarship. Oh heck no! That's why I uh, either I try to explain no going on yourself. Well, I try to explain why I think it, or at least if it's so, uh, you see how I'm. Uh, uh, dabbing on endlessly here. Uh, uh, if it's too complex, I try to refer to writings where I've said the stuff. But uh, I find that I am always open to revising my views and have repeatedly revised them and hold all opinions tentatively. Uh, I started out as an evangelical apologist and then went on to a kind of more moderate New Testament critical thing and stayed as neo-Orthodox as I felt I could, and I eventually found that reading uh, Bauer and a lot of the old higher critics of Old and New Testament who seem to go unread today, uh, that uh, my views became more and more radical uh, despite my expectations. I've been very surprised. But every time I have found a view that I disagreed with, I would uh, read it to try to see if there was something to it. I would think that people don't hold views for no reason. Let me see if I can understand this. And so often I found myself convinced once I rendered myself teachable. Often I don't, uh, but but often I do, and I'm, I'm always eager for more. In fact, I said right at the beginning of the conversation, if you would do me the favor of, of sending me notes you made in criticism, I would like to uh, to, to uh, see someone else's scrutiny of my views and uh, try to uh, improve it from there. I, I don't have a party line exactly. I'm, I'm trying to just... I guess be sort of Socratic, suggesting perspectives and and uh, and facts that people seem to me to be ignoring to see what they will make of them. But you know, I'm not trying to win disciples or prove anything to anybody. Uh, you, you know, you, you mentioned that there's got when you read somebody and you see the conclusions they have, then you ask, "Gee, I wonder what reasons he has for moving in that direction." Well, if people can do that uh, w w with your work as well. Amen. Is there Amen. No there's no such thing, and I would say this too about political issues with Bill O'Reilly, which would probably upset him, but there is no such thing as a no-spin zone. 
we all do have presuppositions, mm-hmm. and we need so when we draw our conclusions, we need to remember our presuppositions. We need to be humble. We need to be modest, and then we need to test it with what everybody else is saying as well. Right. Oh, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not saying that uh, that we automatically just follow the crowd like you mentioned before. But I think the question the question has to be raised: Why do you see things that nobody else sees? Why do you see things that put you in the in the the, the, the very small minority of New Testament scholarship. Well, on almost every one of these positions, it's that's a very good question, and I have I don't claim really any originality. I've read older critics that nobody bothers reading anymore, and whose views are even misrepresented in general surveys of introductory textbooks and so on. F. C. Bauer, W. C. von Manen, and others. Uh, who uh, who fought out a lot of these issues a long time ago, and uh, I expected not to be convinced uh, with some of these issues, and I found, like, uh, gee, what do you know? I've never heard anybody address this, uh, and it makes a lot of sense to me. I've even sought out refutations of them and uh, found uh, nothing to uh, to really match it, or some more recent scholars like Robert Eisenman. Uh, to me, he has a very eye-opening, uh, astonishing, way of rereading uh, of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the New Testament that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, Hermann Devering, uh, kind of an heir to the old Tubingen critics and so on. So there are a lot of neglected people whose works just are not dealt with anymore that I find uh, very instructive. Well, yeah, and I, I think uh, most New Testament scholars, and then maybe they're wrong, maybe you're right, but most New Testament scholars would refer to like F.C. Bauer and, and others like that as discredited Rather than That's what I used to think. I used to read people like Ward Gask, and they would say, well, of course, nobody buys this anymore. Years later, I finally read Bauer and realized these guys are not even describing his views correctly. It's just a major slander job. I read, uh, read the guy with the Messianic Secret, Wilhelm Vreda, and everybody writes him off. Well, I finally decided to read Vreda. They're not even describing his view correctly, and, and so on again and again. Harnack on why he thought uh, precisely. Silla had written the epistle of the Hebrews, or who the heck knows, but but I found they just grossly misrepresented his view, and it actually had a lot more going for it. So I have found, if you want to know what uh, the options really are, you got to read these people for yourself, and not the uh, not their uh, their latter day uh, summarizers. No matter where they stand, you really have to read these old guys, and there are treasures when you do. Yeah, well, and uh, now you, you mentioned. Uh... Uh, John's Gospel and John portraying a different, uh, a different, uh, type of Jesus and his teaching and things of that sort. Uh, Richard Balkham of, uh, of, uh, uh, University of St. Andrews, he's recently written a couple books. One where he argues that the, uh, the Synoptic Gospels were basically based on eyewitness testimonies. And then, uh, and then he argues that, uh, in his, uh, work, his latest work on the Gospel of John, where he's trying to argue, and he doesn't believe the Apostle John wrote it, but he believes uh, that a beloved disciple of Jesus, the one whom Jesus loved, uh, who was not the Apostle John, but was a different John and lived in the Jerusalem area, wrote it. Uh, but he argues there uh, for it being based on eyewitness testimony. He doesn't see any problem in the different, the slightly different portrait of the Jesus of the Synoptics and the Jesus of the Gospel of John. And again, getting back to my police officer, uh, illustration, you have the same basic report of the death, resurrection, appearances, and deity of Christ. That same thing that is reported uh, by different witnesses. Now, of course, uh, some would argue that this guy borrowed from that guy. Yeah, there's a lot of reason to think so. And uh, and you know, the problem here is you're, you're just saying, let's split the difference. The, the number of things where they differ, there's so many of them and so many specific ones, you just got to say, wait a minute, somebody's not in touch with the facts here. You don't throw out the core. You don't throw out the core based you on... You might have to. The, you the, might the, have to. Uh, I mean, we know that these authors all were big fans of Jesus and believe he rose from the dead, sure. But, but that's not evidence that they're right. And when you want to know if they have adequate evidence, you have to start looking at, at the minute uh, data we have. You can't just say, well, on the whole, they agree with the hell. Uh, no, uh, they, they may have these broad beliefs because of a common creed they hold. Uh, that, and, and by the way, I must interject here. This, this is a common question coming from the chat room that, again, I could be wrong, but it, it, some people say it, it appears as if 
um, you know, Bob, you, you're getting pretty much attacked on your scholar, on your uh, on your uh, bias, and that your scholarship is affected by by your by your bias, and uh, and yet uh, at the same time. It seems like Phil, you aren't really addressing Bob's criticisms so far tonight. Uh, it seems like whenever you bring up bring up something, Bob tries to address it so far. And however, you don't really seem it's like you just ignore him and start going in somewhere else. It's like you don't really address where he feels that there are obvious problems or oddities uh, in the Synoptic Gospels that need to be addressed. And it seems like you don't address those really so far tonight. That that appears to be what we're seeing. And some people are accusing you of kind of really of a few ad hominems tonight against Bob. How would you respond? Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I don't. I don't think that's the case. I don't think he's really addressing the the, the, the core issue of the uh, of the creed of First Corinthians fifteen and uh, and the reasons why the ball. He, he just keeps saying that the reason why the majority of New Testament scholars disagree with him is because they're spinning. Is because of their oh, biases. No, no. That's 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 not the case. So I take oh, the trouble to go into the First Corinthians fifteen thing. Sure, sure, why not? That might have us here for a while, but I'll be happy to do it. Uh, Reggie, is that okay with you? or with uh, that I, I, Actually, let's see here. Let me see if I have any questions here. I'm going to give the few listeners a chance to get yeah, some things yeah. in here. Keep that thought, though, because that's kind of what we've been saying, or some, well, they've been saying in the chat rooms, that they wanted to hear a point by point and have each of you address those points and then move on. To, to somewhere else to see if we can come meet in the middle somewhere, see if we can agree. Oh, you know what? Maybe Phil might say, you know what? There, there is a problem there, and that's something I've been thinking about. Uh, or maybe you might say the same. So it's kind of what we've been looking for. But we do have a question coming from, let's see here. Oops, scroll down here. Steve says, um, well, this, this is just as relevant to the conversation in many respects. He says, could Dr. Price address the son of man? Uh, it is... Yeah, the quote, quote, son of man, end quote. It is clearly a reference to the divine figure in Daniel. Jesus calls himself uh, that all the time, but the early Christians in the non-Gospels almost never call him that. Doesn't that give credence to the fact that he never saw himself as such? This is very Bob. The, uh, the epistles, for instance, do not call him that. That is... Uh, Jesus is depicted in the Gospels as calling himself the Son of Man, a reference to the divine figure in Daniel 7, but the epistles do not refer to him as the Son of Man, and this mitigates against Jesus having called himself that? Is that what the questioner is saying? Um, it says he did see himself as such. Okay, yeah. Um, well, it seems to me that the uh, Daniel 7 thing is part of an old creation myth that has been, as, as Note points out, that's been updated as a sort of political allegory and prophecy, and that uh, this one like a son of man was Yahweh himself, uh, fresh from an encounter with having destroyed the, the sea beasts that came out of the sea. It's another version of the old combat creation story. So that, yes, that was that was not just the, the angel Michael or something. It was supposed to be Jehovah himself. Uh, and, however, as uh, Maurice Casey shows, for instance, no fan of my work, by the way, uh, he, uh, as he points out, in rabbinic and apocalyptic and other literature, when we find references to Daniel 7, even messianic ones, it seems not to have been used as a title of the Messiah or even a synonym for the Messiah, but it kind of, if this seems to make any sense to you, uh, it sort of does to me, a kind of a shorthand reference to the passage which they said is about the coming of the Messiah, though they didn't want to make a one-to-one -one identification. Well, uh, Gaze of Vermesh also says it wasn't really a, a title, uh, that even in Enoch it's not used as such. There are phrases uh, recalling Daniel 7, but they're this son of man, that son of man, the son of man who is appointed unto glory, etc., etc., but that it isn't used as a title there. Mm -hmm. So what is it in the Gospels? There, there seem to be three different uses, and in my uh, translation, uh, the ones where the idea of just human beings in general with an application to the speaker, uh, like uh, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head, uh, things like that. Uh, I, I say a man. I think that's, that's all it means there, as like in the Psalms sometimes or in Ezekiel. Uh, when there are uh, references to the apocalyptic son of man of Daniel, uh, 
when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? I render it with a little bit of more of the Daniel text. When the one like a Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, the thing is, uh, even if Jesus said many of these things, are they even likely to refer to him? Well, the ones where they do, definitely, like the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, uh, mm -hmm. this, uh, this may be, uh, this certainly is a self-reference, but it isn't a theological one. Mm -hmm. uh, the, if you say the Son of Man has no place to lay his head, same thing. Uh, if you say the coming of the Son of Man, it's interesting that Jesus, in the original version of the saying, speaks of this person in the third person. Right. Uh, is he talking about himself, or is he like John the Baptist, who speaks of the coming one as a as a further uh, eschatological figure? It's just not clear that uh, even if you say Jesus said these things, that he's talking about himself right. as a it, divine figure. It, 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 it doesn't mean the same thing in every instance. It's not, it's not like Bob almost is like you're saying. Is I mean, I mean writers uh, uh, began to maybe have some confusion, some confusion about maybe what that meant. Maybe some of the later. Yeah, or at least our readers do. Uh, the readers do. Okay. They, uh, after a while, when they lost sight of, of uh, the, these, ancient, these old uses of, of Son of Man, which you still have in the Mishnah and various Jewish writings, I think they were they knew what they were saying. They didn't think Jesus was referring to the Messiah when he right. says the Son of Man has no place to lay But that's the, the point, though, Dr. Price. If the apostles or whoever wrote the New Testament, since you seem to date the entire New Testament towards the close of the first century A.D., again, stepping outside of uh, the vast majority of New Testament scholarship, but since you, you know, the authors, if they wanted to make Jesus the Messiah, you would expect them to call Jesus the Messiah, the Christ, on page after page of the Gospels, and that's not there. Instead, Jesus identifies himself he chooses to identify himself as the Son of Man because he did not want the, the Jews. The Jews had uh, kind of corrupted the uh, definition of the word Messiah to mean just a military, political conqueror. And so Jesus decided, I'm going to call myself the Son of Man. There's not a whole lot written on that in Jewish literature. And it's a vague passage from Daniel chapter 7. I'm going to call myself the Son of Man to define my own ministry. And then this the is another church, great exegetical myth. Where is anything church, like that suggested in the Gospels that Jesus knew he was the Messiah, but he figured he'd uh, get, you know give the wrong idea, so he said this. This is, I've heard that all my life. Where is that ever explained in the Bible? Well, over and over again, where the people wanted to make him king by force, it didn't mean that they wanted to uh, force him to be king, but it meant that they wanted to pick up weapons and swords and have him be their Messiah and conquer the Romans. And Jesus was there to save them from their sins, so Jesus defined his own ministry, gave himself a, a blank check so that he could define his own ministry by calling himself the Son of Man. That's well, why this... after the Gospels you only see it on the, the mouth of Stephen uh, when he's about to be stoned in, in, in the book of Acts chapter 8, and then it just drops off the face of history. See, these New Testament scholars that are arriving at these conclusions are not evangelicals. And just be, because New Testament scholarship is moving in the direction of evangelicalism, in other words, they're proving more and more of the New Testament is authentic, is reliable, that's not my fault. Uh, but, uh, but whatever the case, the Son of Man saying, there's strong evidence that Jesus used the Son of Man saying... Not at all. And, and that the early church just dropped it. Otherwise, we would find it in these... Uh, in these other uh, writings, the writing. No, we wouldn't, because they're less dependent on the Aramaic uh, Palestinian uh, background of it. Like in in Paul, there's not a single place where Christos even seems to refer to the Jewish Messiah. It's always used as if it's simply Mister Christ. Uh, these people in, in these communities, they didn't give a damn about the Jewish Messiah. That's like a uh, us being again, though, that's, that's your spinning because you can find a place. Find the text. Uh, Paul is as Jewish as Jewish gets, and and, no, and, and no. if you don't see that, that's because you don't even acknowledge that Paul wrote these letters. Uh, but uh, whatever the case, Paul provides strong uh, arguments from the Old Testament that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. And yes, uh, but you know, within 20 years, Jesus had proven to so many people that he was the Jewish Messiah. Oh, this is absurd. How can he have been doing that if he isn't even calling himself the Messiah?
Well, because he did not want the Jews to identify him just as a military political conqueror. But for whatever reason, if he didn't call himself the Messiah, notice in, in Caesarea Philippi, who do men say that I am? Nobody says the Messiah. He can scarcely have been teaching this. So how is he going around proving it? Well, they, they, the Christ, the Son of the Living God, the Christ, the Messiah. You but, mean, uh, but, to but even He's beyond that, to that. In Q, you have in Q where uh, John the Baptist's disciples come to... Uh, uh, to Jesus and ask, are you the one or should we wait for another? And he quotes the uh, the miracles that were predicted of the coming of the kingdom from the book of Isaiah and to, to basically let, let him know that I am the one. Uh, but he wasn't going to go around. He doesn't say. When Jesus publicly announced himself as the Messiah was when he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey fulfilling Zechariah 9.9. 9. Which That's only about... You know, thousands of other people were doing the same day because this was the entrance of liturgy to the temple, and everybody's riding these things. They didn't raise the dead. They didn't give sight to the blind. Neither did he. They were waiting for him to come. Well, even even Q has him performing miracles, casting out a, a demon. Uh, Somebody said the that he did in Q. The, what's that? Somebody said that he did in Q. This is proof? Well, uh, Q is supposed to, according to... Uh, According to even liberal New Testament scholars, Q is supposed to go back as far as Mark or even earlier than Mark. So again, you have... You so know, what? Uh, that's, that's not a tape recording. I mean, the, the amazing fideism in this. If somebody said it, well, that proves it. Testament, Dr. Price, you are asking for a tape recording. And there are no tape recordings. Amen. In the first century A.D. And so are, are, are you skeptical about all the entire history of the first century A.D.? Uh, well, an awful lot of it, yeah. But, but, but you and shouldn't I be? If you reject all of Paul's letters, you should be skeptical of everything from the first century A.D. Right. Yes, sir, so then you are. So then you would. So basically, not only do you want to change New Testament scholarship, you want to change our history books. Well, can I say, Bob, uh, you're pretty much you're skeptical when you feel that skepticism is necessary, is needed. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's some things where there's no reason to question certain things because it doesn't seem like anybody could have been axe grinding but constantly every evening with a campaign coverage uh, I mean every day there, there, there are all kinds of things said that as Collingwood said are evidence for the history of propaganda but not necessarily for the history of events and, uh, and the, the Christian apologist is eager to believe everything because down beneath it all he's an inerrantist and uh, you just can't and nobody else would approach any literature that way, assuming that, like, we can't determine, for instance, whether it uh, just comes up in movies, you see, uh, was Hitler an occultist, as in the Indiana Jones movies. I've read loads of serious books that assume he is, and other ones that say, no, there's no evidence of that. We can't seem to determine a thing like that. It wasn't even a century ago, and it's fully documented. There's a lot of things where we just do have to remain skeptical. Okay. I know that the Holocaust happened because my father was present at the uh, the opening up of Dachau. I mean, there's no room for doubt on that. Maybe a thousand years from mm -hmm. now there will be, but we're close enough to these things to know what happened. But by 2,000 years ago, with these claims that sound so much like contemporary myths, but somehow we're certain that, oh, no, these mm -hmm. really happened. Well, well, the life of Alexander the Great, certainly the, the, the stories is of his military victories uh, sound like mythology, and I'm sure certain aspects of it uh, weren't absolutely true. But when everything's said and done, uh, I think you would agree with me that Alexander the Great was this great conqueror about 300 years b before. Well, that's a, I, I must interject because I mean, we're running out of time here. And I think you're making up a really good point uh, about. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, uh, Alexander the Great. Uh, I think I remember coming across one myth that he was uh, speaking. Uh, I think he was born speaking, or so like Caesar was, or something like that. Mm -hmm. but, 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 but as but, far as his military but, conquest. But, 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 but I was going to say yeah, here well, that what, that what, what it's three or four centuries we have the the. the so much of the evidence. But what I was going to say was that might be true. Things about so, his military conquest. We have no reason to to, so, to reject that. They, they don't say. He, well, actually, they say he imprisoned Gog and Magog. Is that likely that he is exactly that? right? And so, Bob, I would say then then you would have to dissect those parts. You would critically investigate those parts that you would think would be mythological, fantastical, and not reality, right? Like a uh, flying but horse. How do you remove? How do you dissect? What do you? Why do you dissect things well, that okay. are well, this, okay. well, Phil, if you, if, in the in the in Phil, the gospels about Jesus? Well, Phil, you said things that, that pass the test of his similarity, like the Son of Man sayings, 
or think they that don't. We, Phil, can you, you hear me? Can you hear me talking? Why, to you? why do we Let me throw pick up them my phone out? A bit, so maybe you can't hear me. Phil, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, you mentioned earlier about, sorry, I'm jumping in this for a second here, but you mentioned earlier that Bob has a problem with miracles, and I'm thinking, well, it seems like in the realm of miracles, then, anything's a go. Then why don't you accept the miracles of other mythologies and other cultures who have very miraculous stories? Do you accept those as reality as well, or, or do you only accept the ones that are within your Christian paradigm? Yeah, you, you, miracles, just because you believe that certain miracles have occurred, don't mean that you accept everything. In fact, Miracles make no sense. There'd be no well, how way do you to know? identify miracles. How, how do you discern? How do you, you know which miracles are real and which drop. How, how do you know which miracles are real and which ones aren't? That's what there has to be the, the laws of nature as a backdrop for you to identify when the laws of nature have been superseded. But when we have eyewitness testimony uh, given to us in like the ancient creed, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8, where Paul even adds his own testimony, and then Paul right after that talks about that we preach that Jesus is risen from the dead. He's including Peter with that. So he and Peter, he and the Jerusalem church, preach that Jesus is risen from the dead. You have this ancient creed that goes all the way back. That is that is really good evidence. And I don't think that we should just take a bias. The uh, um, uh, Boyd Boyd and uh, Eddie, in their book, uh, The Jesus Legend, have a really good chapter that refutes the uh, the Western academic bias against miracles. And they show that... Which I do not share, by the way. That? I do not share that bias. Well, that's good. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. I, I wish there would be more uh, scholars and historians who would not not take their philosophical uh, uh, bias against miracles and then just based on that start uh, critiquing and tearing out of, of the New Testament. I think we have things that are multiply attested by Jesus, uh, about Jesus, that go back to the first century A.D. In fact, I would argue the creeds go to the 30s A.D. I would argue that Paul's writings go between 50 and uh, and 64 A.D., and most of the Testament scholars would agree on, on that one. And so we have very good evidence for the miracles of Christianity. Now, when you go to the miracle claims in other religions, I don't see that kind of evidence. And uh, But I do. I, I, I think in uh, I think even right now, even most Westerners, uh, two, two polls, one in 1998, the other, I believe, was 18, 1989, uh, where uh, over 80% of Americans believe that either God answers prayers or that they had been uh, miraculously healed, or they knew someone who did it. I think it was 33% believe that they were miraculously healed. But whatever the case, Western academic scholarship, which has a bias against miracles, they're not even, not only are they not in touch with the non-Western world, but they're not even in touch uh, with, the, with the West itself. And, and I don't understand. Circles. So as long as it's Christian, that is more believable? Is that what you're saying? No, as long as it's better attested, as long as it has strong evidence for it. Uh, I think that's why Christianity grew so quickly. Um, uh, and I know doc, Dr. Price is going to, he's the apostle of denial. He's going to deny <laughs> Joseph, what we learned from apostle of denial. Pliny the Younger. Uh, from, uh, uh, he's going to reject what we have from Josephus, uh, what even uh, the, uh, the, the, the Shlomo Pines uh, Arabic translation, uh, that passage there. He's going to deny these, these things that we have from non-Christian sources, but I think that the evidence is clear that Christianity grew enough so that even non-Christian writers uh, and politicians were writing about it and about its rapid growth and about what do you do with these Christians and all. And the reason why it was growing that rapidly was because the miracles were well attested. How would people even know that a couple of decades down the line? Know what? That, that whether miracles in the lifetime of Jesus were well attested or not, they would have, have no more evidence than we do. Uh, no, I, I, I think you could find credible eyewitness testimony even for the supernatural if you don't have a bias against it. I mean, the time of plenty? Well, yeah, he, he's, writing, he's writing in 112 A.D., and, uh, and what he, his report there is that is he's writing to Emperor Trajan, uh, you know that, and... Yeah, but... um, and, and, he, and he's basically telling them that, yeah, these Christians, they worship uh, uh, Christ as a god. And so he's saying that they worship Jesus as god, and he's asking for advice about, about the, uh, the how to arrest them and try them and, and things of that sort, because it is becoming a problem. He's the governor of what, Bithynia, and it's becoming a problem at that point. This is no little small group. So so you have the, the Christianity is, is growing in leaps and bounds, and you have... Uh, plenty of the younger saying that by in 112 A.D. 
Christians are known as people who worship Jesus as a god. So now we have to trace it. They say, okay, well, they're worshiping Jesus as God there. Then you can go to the New Testament writings and see that they believe Jesus was God there. And you can go all the way back to the ancient creeds and go back to the 30s A.D. and see that Jesus is proclaimed as the risen Lord. So, uh, one, one, one challenge in the chat room, Bob, Bob, forgive me, in the chat room someone says, well, yeah, but there are plenty of people who claim they're eyewitness uh, accounts of uh, alien abductions, too, and we can trace that way back when people are saying very similar stories mm. as well. Mm. That go even further back. So since people oh, have been, I, I think they need to be investigated. I'm not saying I would side with them, but I'm saying when people mm -hmm. make claims, we need to investigate them. But if people are sincere enough to suffer for those claims, like the early church, uh, then I think we had to be had better look at them even closer. And uh, I try to look at this stuff closely, and so does the Dr. Price. We come to two diametrically opposed positions, uh, but I just can't understand. Uh, how the vast majority of New Testament scholars would grant that Paul wrote seven, at least those seven letters. Looking at uh, Dr. arguments, uh, where, where uh, my uh, uh, Journal of Higher Criticism is reprinting uh, von Manen's English writings uh, shortly, and you can see for yourself the cogent arguments on behalf of this position. All right. Uh, well, uh, wow, we've been going at this for 90 minutes now. Um, we, I would like to wrap up a few questions, uh, and we'll just answer these quickly. Then we'll go and I'll let you guys uh, get off because this has been quite a roller coaster ride here. And I appreciate you guys' patience and and uh, having this debate and discussion. Uh, this is a very simple question for you, uh, Phil, but you'll be surprised. Uh, I really have two questions for you. But uh, is Jesus the Son of God, or is Jesus God in flesh, or is it both? think that the, in the Jewish mindset, too often we look at the words in our English translation mm -hmm. and we come to the wrong conclusion. In the Jewish mindset, I think it, that is, is explained well in John 5, 17 and 18, uh, where the Jews picked up stones to stone Jesus, not only because he was breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. And so in the Jewish understanding, if a, if a guy showed up on the scene and said, I am the Son of God, and he is my father in a special way, a unique way, that he's not anybody else's father. Mm -hmm. And he's equating himself with God. He's saying he's of the same nature as the father. Hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's not real... That's not real unique, real radical. I'm not saying anything radical. You can you can find that in, in print by many scholars. All right, so, so what should... Okay. So the the appropriate thing then for a person to say would be what in reference to who Jesus really was. Oh, you could call him the Son of God, or you can call him God the Son. They basically, for all practical purposes, it comes out to mean the same thing. Okay, all right, Bob, you agree? Well, uh, just one caveat, uh, John. I don't think necessarily approves of the views he attributes to the. Uh, critics of Jesus, uh, he doesn't think Jesus broke the Sabbath, though he thinks Jesus' opponents charge him with it. I'm not sure he's saying Jesus made himself equal with God, and that it may be that uh, these guys are as wrong in thinking so as when he says, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus is talking about cannibalism, and it's remarkable that though John does have very high Christology, he has Jesus seeming to back down at one place where he says, wait a minute, doesn't it say uh, the scripture can't be broken? I said, you are God. Now, if he said this to those to whom the word of God came, how can he be ready to stone me because I said, I am the son of God? Like, I'm not making a claim as big as they did. And the Bible says this. What am I saying that's, that's bad? I'm only saying I'm the son of God. It, it's as if, it, well, I think the reason for this is that John has passed down through many hands. There were, there were Johannine sectarians that had various Christologies and, uh, each has made its imprint on the text. Uh, but, and in some places you do have an absolute, like almost Patropassian Christology that Jesus is the Father. I and the Father are one. And then some, some redactor has said, now wait a minute, that's going too far. And that's Jesus backpedal. Or don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, whatever that means. I think you got all kinds of views in, in uh, the Gospel of John, though you certainly do have the very high Christology as well. Well, I think, I think that in the Gospel of John, 
uh, he presents Jesus as the Son of God, and he presents Jesus as equal with God in, in numerous occasions, which I think he, he pretty much equates the two. But in that passage, he kind of, I think, gave the, the false impression. He said, I and the Father are one. So he took up stones to stone him, for which of my works are you going to stone me? Not for your works, but for your words, because you being a man make yourself out to be God. Then Jesus throws a monkey wrench in there when he brings up the scriptures can't be broken, and God called them God. So God symbolically called some some other people gods who weren't really God. He just symbolically mm -hmm. gave them the title. And then he says, now, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? That proves my case. By saying I and the Father are one, that's the same as saying um, I am the Son of God. And John sees no difference there. But then he, but Jesus is saying, look, I, I perform miracles to prove it. You guys want to stone me. But God even called non-gods gods. Then don't I have the right to call myself the Son of God? After all, God sent me into the world. And Doesn't so I think sort of, he's claiming to be God. Doesn't that kind of imply he's not literally a god either? No, I, I, I think he's just saying he's a separate person from the Father, but he's one in nature with the Father. Don't forget, he, the passage right before it, he said, no one can snatch them out of my hand, no one can snatch them out of the Father's hand, I and the Father are one. Yeah, that I think is. I, my, my thing here is that I think that John has been continually rewritten as, as copies bounce back and forth between the rival sects, like in First John, you know, so they went out from us and they weren't really ever part of us and they wouldn't have left. And you have these Johannine uh, factions, all Jesus worshippers with different views, and I kind of think that uh, we have a harmonized uh, Mary Orem edition of John with everybody's readings in there, so that sometimes there are these double barreled uh, statements of the highest possible Christology and then attempts to, to backpedal by others that uh, thought, no, no, wait a minute, that's going too far. The same kind of debates one sees in the Council of Nicaea. Mm -hmm. see, and I, I would see it as Richard Balkum sees it, that, uh, that the Gospel of John is presenting eyewitness testimony, and it's very clear what, what, what is being said, what Jesus is, is claiming to be. And so I don't see all this this stuff going back and forth like you do uh I, again i think you're you're seeing stuff that uh, that i would not see well obviously um the the bible mentions this is to both of you uh the bible mentions and i guess i'm really asking you phil if you agree with this or not the bible mentions that basically we all know god and those who deny yahweh are without excuse do you do you believe that uh i i i i accept romans 1 where Paul says that deep down inside, uh, people know the Creator God, but we suppress that truth. But uh, I, I see, you know, human beings, I think the easiest person to lie to is yourself. And I think we all do that. We suppress truth uh, about ourselves. That's why I was talking about our own biases that, that everybody spins. So Dr. Price thinks the New Testament scholars are spinning. I think he's spinning even more than, than they are. I could be wrong. Because I'm doing a little bit of my own spinning. Well, it's, it's, it's funny because you answered our, own, our own biases and all. Yeah, yeah, you answered my second part of the question, Dan. Because I was going to ask you that. Well, if it is, if this is true, then why do we need uh, Christian apologetics? So I guess that we need Christian apologetics to stop us from lying to ourselves. Yeah. Well, I, I think a, a good portion of Christian apologetics is to, is to remove, uh, to basically refute arguments against God and to remove the intellectual smokescreen, because I think in the end it does come down to a moral decision of the heart. I think that the basis of, of a human being, uh, the basis of free will, is our drive for human autonomy, but also uh, our thirst for God. And, uh, and I think we either choose to, to go with the thirst for God or we choose that drive for human autonomy and then not want God. It's like Paul Vitz, a Freudian psychologist, he used Freudian psychology and his attempted refutation of Freud, he said that in Freudian language, uh, the atheist decides, uh, desires to kill the father image. In other words, they don't want God's authority over their life. Now, again, we're dealing with all, you know, subconscious things, and I think we all have some of that, and so I would agree with, with Romans 1, but I, I think an atheist would pass a lie detector's test if he says he doesn't believe that God exists. Because the easiest person to fool is ourselves. Well, it could also be that many Christians seek out this father figure because many of them then maybe they want a more effective father role model in their lives, and so they seek the greatest and biggest of all. I wouldn't go there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go there. I wouldn't 
go there because what Paul Vitz in his study showed that you cannot put uh, born again Christians in any one particular uh, oh, of course. I, I agree. statistical I'll, group. I, I uh, agree. But he did do an interesting study. I'm not sure if I agree with it, uh, but uh, he did do an interesting study with first generation, really vocal atheists. And, uh, and showed the, uh, that, uh, I, I think the ones that he studied, every one of them either had a real, had real issues with their father or there was no, no father, an absentee hmm. father. And so, um, Isn't that like, yeah, 60, that like, like 60%, yeah. like 60 of like all family, like most families or something? <laughs> but, uh, but okay. Huh. You know, the, the, I've, I have not read Vitz's book, but I heard him give a summary of it once and it's very fascinating. And along the same lines, uh, Robert Sproul's book, uh, uh, the psychology of atheism. Uh, we, Crow, yes, yes. That is a brilliant and fascinating book that, that brings in uh, uh, the uh, the idea of the holy and uh, Rudolf Otto, and uh, mentions this as the great trauma, the the mysterium tremendum that uh, we shrink from, and he pulls in Freud and says this is the trauma that the unbeliever will not face, and he brings in Romans 1. It is just brilliant. I I'm surprised it hasn't gotten more, uh, more uh, airplay. Right, right. Probably used to call that the, the, the psychology of atheism, I believe, and they changed the title, and I, I wish they went back to the original title, but, but he's actually working off of Paul Vitz's work. And ah, huh. Paul is the theologian, and, and uh, Vitz is the, the uh, psychologist, and uh, so, uh, but but uh, Vitz himself, I, uh, I, he has, I think he has the faith of the fatherless. He has several books that that deal with that particular issue. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, let me see here. Uh, lastly, oh yeah. Um, since this is about the resurrection, we didn't really touch much on that. But I guess I can't help but think when I when I picture the resurrection, and it's, I'm pretty sure Phil, you want to tell me this is a flaw in my thinking, but or my um, visualization of this. But the Bible describes um, Jesus rising uh, bodily, right? Or is there, or is there, or is there, a, or is there another place where, he's, where he rises uh, spiritually? But um, Jesus rises bodily into heaven. Um, doesn't that sound like? I mean, like literally, he rose into the sky. I mean, how do you visualize this? Where is heaven? I mean, where did Jesus rise to? If this really happened, where did he go? And I don't, how come we don't hear much about? Uh, I don't know. I mean, who? No one was there to even see this. So I don't even know how they they would know this, but. Explain to me how that fits. Well, well, the, the, uh, I'm having trouble seeing that. Yes. I think you're confusing the resurrection with the ascension. They're, they're two different things. Okay, sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And the, the Greek words for resurrection uh, in the first century A.D. and before always referred to uh, life coming back to, to a body, that, to a corpse. And you okay, could you're use, right. You could mm -hmm. use that as a figure, but the, 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 the thing itself, though, meant a bodily resurrection. It's only when you get the Gnostics in the second century where they try to talk for spiritual resurrection. But then at the ascension, after on and off appearing to uh, his disciples mm -hmm. and to others over a period of 40 days, he bodily ascends to heaven. And I, I think that was just his way of showing them, don't expect me to come back. And then he just kind of disappears into the clouds. And that, that's why the Apostle Paul could say that Jesus, last of all, Jesus appeared to him as the one untimely born. He was like a baby born after the ninth month. Um because he 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 had his resurrection appearances of Jesus after the ascension. Right. Uh, but whatever the case, That's where right. Jesus is, you know, he bodily ascended into heaven. Is heaven a place? Uh, I, I believe in his resurrection body that he didn't he didn't just go through walls, but he was traveling at the speed of thought. So, you know, the forty days where he was appearing, it seemed like he was only appearing on Sundays. So the other six days, I would assume he was at the Father's right hand. Uh, at that point. Now, what is heaven like? Is heaven material? Is heaven spiritual? Uh, I'm, uh, I don't claim to have all the answers. Right. And I'm, I'm, uh, it doesn't bother me to just put that up, chalk that up as mystery, and I'll let Jesus straighten me out when, when I get to see him. If you, if you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and, yeah, but, and, you know, we could turn that on the atheist, and I don't want to do that. No, well, yeah, I'm not worried. I think he would. Just, if he if he was a loving father and he knows I'm being honest, so I'm not really concerned. Uh, well, that's if, if, about if that. the God of the Bible is the true God, um, then we all fall short. But He loves us so much uh, that He sent His Son and had His Son slaughtered in our place. 
right. as the uh, perfect sacrifice, mm-hmm. and then he gives us that choice to accept or reject that perfect sacrifice. Right. But thank you for correcting me on that. I see where I was confused. You're right, because I think I was thinking about when he reappeared again, and I was thinking of that as a resurrection even. Uh, okay, but... All right, thank you for that. Uh, Bob, you have any comments about the ascension? I've, I've always thought that was quite, there's actually an artistic, uh, or someone wrote a, or, uh, wrote a paragraph about this online, or I shall say they did, the, they did the mathematical calculations, like if he rose into heaven, even traveling at the speed of light, or thought, I don't know, as uh, Phil That's said. Why he, I said they did that for, for their benefit. Once he I, got I beyond figured that. the clouds and beyond, beyond their vision, he could have just put himself in the father's, uh, I, I, the father's I, I, right I, hand it, again, traveling at the speed of sound. And, and, uh, and, speed of, and that's very artsy, Phil, too. Uh, in, the, in the upper room. I don't think he was outside the upper room, looked around, floated into the air, and then, and then absorbed into the wall. I think he just basically, with the spiritual body, with the glorified body, the same body in which he died, but now it's glorified, it has new powers. I believe one of those is not hindered by, by distance or by space. And so you could travel at the speed of thought. That, that's a very good point. It wouldn't be very dramatic if he were to be a nice, big, bright ball of light in a room and then fizzle into, done, into nothing. So I guess maybe the point would be better if he went up into the clouds. I don't know. Uh, Bob, what do you think? Any comments? I don't really want to get into this. This is hours more of... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> understood, understood. Well, well, gentlemen, um, um, I really, really appreciate you both appearing on the program. Uh, we can wrap this up now. Phil, if you want to wrap it up, uh, feel free. And Bob, you want to go ahead and comment later afterwards? Feel free. Go ahead, Phil. Uh, give you have five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I would just five minutes in the whole program, or <laughs> you have five minutes right now <laughs> to go I, ahead. Okay. And close yeah, it. I would just basically say that uh, I presented a case uh, based on the conclusions of most, uh, the vast majority of New Testament scholars that they acknowledge uh, that Jesus. Uh, did call himself Lord. They, not, well, they acknowledge that Jesus uh, died by crucifixion. Uh, uh, the apostles had experiences where they thought they saw the risen Christ on numerous occasions. Their lives were transformed by this. Paul's life was transformed by this. James's life was transformed. Um, I argued from the principle of embarrassment that um, the tomb uh, was found empty. The apostles would not make it up and had the ladies dis- discover the empty tomb at a point in time where a woman's uh, testimony w- was not held in high regard in, in ancient chauvinistic times, and then it made Peter and John, the leaders of the early church, look bad because they rejected their view. I showed you the Son of Man saying this is not something that the early church put into Jesus' mouth. If they were going to put words into Jesus' mouth, they would have had him calling himself the Messiah over and over and over again, or coming right out and calling himself God over and over again. And that wasn't the case. But when you look at the Son of Man sayings, which which many New Testament scholars attribute to Jesus, you see that he is claiming uh, uh, that he is God and he has the ability to forgive sins, and he is the Son of the living God. Um, and uh, the, the work of Larry Hurtado uh, shows that he goes back to the early 30s A.D., and the Christians are already praying to Jesus alongside the Father. And so you have all this, all this evidence of... of Early, in fact, even uh, N.T. Wright with the resurrection, he says that the resurrection accounts in the Gospels are not theologically developed, like like when Paul talks about the resurrection just 20 years later. And so uh, he says that the resurrection accounts, not the Gospels themselves, but the resurrection accounts must predate Paul's writings. Now, with with Dr. Price's views. Uh, New Testament scholars disagree with him. He, you know, he admits his views are way out there, that he's a voice crying in the wilderness. Even liberal New Testament scholars, like the, the Jesus Seminar, uh, do not uh, agree with him. That's why he says that they're way uh, too conservative. I believe that uh, Dr. Price's theories are highly uh, speculative and lack uh, manuscript evidence when he gives like the, uh, these interpolations. All the manuscript copies that we have, uh, of that portion, that the, those passages are there and intact. So that ancient creed, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 5, and then Paul adds his own little thing at the end. Uh, right in there we see uh, an ancient creed uh, where Jesus appeared uh, to Peter. He appeared to the apostles on two occasions. He appeared to James. He appeared to over 500 people at one time. And last of all, so one untimely born, he appeared uh, to Paul. And uh, so that ancient creed... Uh, uh, most uh, across the spectrum of New Testament scholarship, uh, they acknowledge that. Um, uh, Dr. Price has a revisionist history of the first 150 years of the history of the church, 
So they has guys like Irenaeus and, and, and coming on the scene and, and acting like the Apostolic Fathers wrote 80 years earlier when in reality uh, they were his contemporaries. Nobody else, nobody agrees with that. And so he, he takes away this chain from 30 A.D., from the early 30s A.D., all the way to 180 A.D. by just turning uh, Irenaeus and the other church fathers. Basically, I, I don't know if, it is, if it's a conspiracy or what, but it's all, he, he's got this little gap of time where we have the oldest existing fragments and manuscripts, and he thinks that that silence gives him the, the right to uh, rewrite uh, history. Scholars who disagree with Dr. Price are just spinning, he says. They're just spinning for the magisterium. Uh, yet many of these scholars deny the resurrection and have no reason to spin in that direction. So uh, whatever the case, he believes that Irenaeus and these early church fathers, apparently that fooled everybody except uh, Dr. Price, and um, there's no paper trail of what he believes the New Testament actually said. All we have are these empirical... Uh, fragments and manuscripts, he wants us to ignore those, to trust him, that the ones that were older than that said many different things, and um, and uh, I would just uh, differ on that. So 2,000 years after the fact, Dr. Price arrives on the scene, he's able to see what New Testament scholars and historians all missed. He sees contradictions that no one else sees, like the 1 Corinthians uh, 15 and Galatians 1 and 2. He talked about that in the Habermas debate. Uh, he rejects manuscript evidence and then creates an alternative history that left no paper trail. So he's a, he, he alone apparently is able to reconstruct the history of the early church. He asks us to trust him. He's right. Everybody else is wrong. Everybody else is just spinning. Well, thank you. Five minutes right on the dot. Uh, Bob? Well, uh, I don't really need to take that long. Uh, it's clear that uh, everything he says is based grossly on the appeal to consensus and authority. Uh, I just don't think that is interesting. One has to look at the specifics of the argument, which uh, I try to do, but uh, it's clear that, that uh, this evening my words are like raindrops on a hot day they evaporate before they can strike the ground and uh, none of my words have struck the ground i doubt if there's much chance they will if i just repeat all of them so i, I will decline the opportunity to do so well all right uh, well thank you both gentlemen i really appreciate your